Hi, and welcome back. And here we are continuing in our journey through Galician Jewish history in its East European context. And we left off talking about the development and impact of the Haskalah. And the last things we talked about was the stimulation in the 1860s and 70s in Russia by the very partial emancipation beginning to happen, uh, even more so, by the way, in Russian Poland, but then crushed by its reversal after 1881 and the ar arrival of competing ideologies out of the Haskalah, assimilationism, Ju modern Jewish politics, Jewish nationalism, and socialism, and so on. And the last point we made was that these ideologies are not coming simply because the, meant because the Haskalah uh, was seen to be empty as a result of anti-Semitism and so on, but rather that the Haskalah itself is actually giving birth to these ideas from an internal momentum going on. It's not simply anti-Semitism, it's not simply oppression, but actually there's an internal development in Jewish society leading towards these politics and identities, and we'll come back to that next time. In Galicia, there's a different development because of the nature of the regime of, of the province, because of the unique ethnic combination going on there and so on. Recall the very early relaxation of anti-Jewish discrimination since already the time of Joseph II. Certainly the Jews are not emancipated, but they are uniquely tolerated in many ways compared to the former Polish Jewish brethren in the other parts of divided Poland. Beginning in the 1840s and culminating in the 1867 restructuring of the Habsburg Empire, Galician Jews would be transformed by their total political emancipation something absolutely unique in Eastern Europe among former Polish Jews. And this combination of wide-ranging civil and political rights following 1867, which is really more typical of what's going on elsewhere in Central and in Western Europe, with an East European type Jewry, Yiddish speaking, overwhelmingly and disproportionately commercial, and religiously traditional, almost completely Hasidic in Galicia, this is part of the formula that sets Galician Jewry apart. It's part of what makes them so interesting. It's a true borderland between East and West, an Eastern-type Jewry under a Western-type regime. And what we're going to do today is look at the process of that emancipation in two phases. First of all, the explosion of activity around the 1848 revolutions that spread across all of Europe, known as the Springtime of Nations. And second of all, uh, the emancipation that comes with the restructuring of the Austrian Empire in 1867, the creation of the so-called dual monarchy, Austria-Hungary, and the development of Galician autonomy, which we'll explain at the end of the lecture. So let's begin. Uh, in the early 19th century, there are officially about a quarter million uh, Jews in Galicia, around 1830, say, probably more. There were probably close to half a million by 1848. It's hard to know exactly. Uh, and the emancipation of the Jews in these decades is really out of the question in a place where neither the peasants nor the burghers had equal rights with the nobility. Uh, the principle we've seen across Europe is that emancipation of the Jews is predicated on the emancipation of society as a whole, on the definitive end of feudalism in favor of liberalism. Liberalism does not mean democracy, but it does mean civil rights. It does mean the breakdown of, of, of caste and feudal order. Now, on the one hand, Technically, Jews had municipal rights since 1789. They were going to be confirmed again in the 1840s. But in practice, this is often, or even always, I would almost say, subverted. Decrees in 1804, 1811, 1821 opened uh, posts in state, city, and judicial offices, opened the ability to be teachers in public schools. They could work as physicians in city service, as lawyers in commercial courts, and as postmen. But in reality, access to any of these occupations was quite difficult and restricted. And there are other restrictions, restrictions on the purchase of property and economic activity and settlement, because feudalism still empowered the nobility in many areas, despite the Austrian Civil Code of 1811. So, for example, there's limited access to live in villages. Uh, limited areas of some towns, especially in western Galicia, famously Krakow, for example, the Jews had to live in Kazimierz outside of the city. Jews couldn't buy landed estates unless they worked it themselves. They couldn't prospect for ore and minerals. And this becomes very important in the second half of the 19th century when massive oil deposits are found in Borisov outside of Drobich. And Galicia, for a few years, becomes the third highest producer of oil in the world after Russia and the United States. Uh, they couldn't be pharmacists until an empire-wide repeal of that restriction in 1832. The kosher meat and candle taxes continued along with Jewish marriage tax and tax for building synagogues or holding private minions. Krakow Jews had other special taxes despite an 1817 statute 
equalizing the city tax burden between Jews and Christians. Marriages had other restrictions also, and as we saw, many Jews actually avoided that simply by having a religious ceremony alone. Before mid-century, Jews were by and large uninterested in fighting this and being engaged in the political process. Some elites, uh, professionals, representatives of communities like Brody, Ternopil, Tarnov, they had sent petitions to the emperor to ameliorate certain conditions or permission to set up societies, you know, society to promote handicrafts among Jews, for example. They protested many of the restrictions noted above, um, but to no real excess, success. And most Jews remained traditional in that sense. Most Jews remain unpoliticized beyond internal Jewish issues. The Hasidic um, Meskilic conflict, for example. Political consciousness begins to emerge during the revolutionary crises of 1846 and 1848 when Galician Jews first taste complete emancipation only to lose it when the revolutions collapsed. And that's the narrative we want to think about as we go through this story, the impact of these revolutionary events on Jewish political consciousness. We begin in 1846 when the revolution broke out in Krakow. In Krakow at that time was still a free city state since 1815, uh, and there was in 1846 an, an insurgency, a revolution by the gentry, by the broader Polish no nobility, and they, you know, annulling serfdom, granting land to serfs, and calling upon the peasants, the Polish-speaking peasants, join us in this insurgency, let's rise up and overthrow the Austrian rulers and reestablish our Polish state. And the Polish-speaking peasants rose up and slaughtered the gentry. Some 2,000 noblemen were dead before the Austrians could restore order. And by the way, there had been other uprisings throughout that spring against the gentry. Hundreds of manors burnt down, hundreds of others killed, and so on. And we have to ask ourselves, why? Why would Polish-speaking peasants rise up against their Polish brothers? Uh, and there's a few reasons to think about. Partially, it's resentment against the nobility. The nobility, for the first half of the 19th century, had subverted Josephinian reforms almost immediately after his death and exploited the peasants quite thoroughly, quite mercilessly. Uh, military service rigorously enforced, duties and taxes increased on them, and so on. Partly, also, this was encouraged by Austria. Austria doesn't encourage revolution, but it was uh, egging them on to think about uh, pushing for increased rights. Um, but most importantly, it was because they were not yet Polish. And I think we spoke about this in another time. They were Galician, if anything. I mean, their Galician identity was surely more powerful than their Polish. And as Galicians, they were Austrian. And they saw themselves as Austrian, as Galician peasants. And their greatest allies in that was the absolutist state against the Polish nobility that were oppressing them. And that's quite interesting. In any event, the insurrection quickly collapsed. Uh, some conservative Polish nobility had the smarts to stay out of it. And it ends with the incorporation of Krakow into Galicia. No more free state. It's now a part of Galicia, West, the capital of West Galicia, in fact. But I want to point out that these Polish insurgents include, deliberately and explicitly, include Jews as fellow Poles. That's very important. And February 23, 1846, is the first documents in Polish territories that call for the abolition of barriers between Jews and others. So this is really quite revolutionary, and this sparks widespread support for the revolution among Krakow Jews. Some 500 Jews enlisted in the Insurrectionary Army, for example, and in National Guard units, uh, mostly secular Jews, but also some traditional Jews, most famously Rabbi Bear Meisels, who is an ardent Polish patriot, later serves as a delegate to the Austrian Constituent Assembly, the so-called Reichstag. He's delivering sermons. Uh, calling on Jews to defend the Polish cause with their lives, as befits, as, quote, as befits the free and brave sons of the motherland. Uh, some anti-revolutionary forces tried to use this as propaganda against the cause as well, accusing Jews of fomenting the moment and so on. Uh, and the government does punish the Jewish community with a large fine for its participation. Uh, in other words, the imperial government recognizes the situation. Uh, but that's absolutely remarkable that's really an important moment of Polish-Jewish brotherhood that has an impact on the people who are part of it. Now, in 1848, nearly all of Europe erupts in nationalist revolution against the monarchic regimes. It begins in Paris in February. Uh, it's known by historians as the spring times of nations because, first of all, many of these are nationalist revolutions. 
But secondarily, you see the rise of new nationalisms. Uh, we'll see the, the Ruthenian, Ukrainian nationalism in particular uh, coming out for the first time. Uh, it arrives in Vienna only a month later in March. And there's no attempt in contrast, though, in, in Galicia to overthrow Austrian rule during the 1848 uprising. The memory of 1846 was only two years old, and that is going to shape Galician political culture for decades. Polish conservatives are going to play ball. They are going to become a bedrock of Austrian rule. And even the Ruthenians are going to attempt to work through the Austrian system rather than revolt against it. The legacy of 46 sticks with the Galicians for a very long time. But when the revolutions break out, Poles, including Jews and Ruthenians send petitions to the emperor demanding national rights and socio-political reforms. This is again in March of 1848, and these are quite typical liberal demands, freedom of the press, a promise of constitutional government, uh, and also meaning the end of serfdom and the end of estate differences to an extent. Uh, they have another address in April, again between the three groups, uh, demanding a single national assembly. The prosperity of the province, they argue, quote, depends on a free and harmonious development of all national forces. A genuine love of the motherland can only exist if the motherland makes no distinction between its children. And thus all classes and religious and religions existing in the nation should be granted equal civic and political rights. All taxes connected with religion as well as all religion-based exclusions and restrictions should be abolished. This is a remarkable declaration, obviously calling, among other things, for the emancipation of Galician Jews. And note that motherland is not only referring to Austria in the broadest sense, but also specifically Galicia itself. Despite the birth of a nascent Polish and Ruthenian national movements in Galicia, which I'll come back to in a few minutes, Galicia, which was really invented out of nowhere, out of whole cloth a uh, century before, has by now a firm provincial identity, including its Jews. They recognize themselves as being Galicians, that their motherland was Galicia, not Poland broadly. Jewish and serf emancipation was certainly two of the most, if not the two most important issues of the time. And on April 18th, in order to secure their support, the serf support for the crown, Franz Stadion, the governor of Galicia, unilaterally frees all serfs who become owners of the land that they worked. This is a preemptive move designed to pull the rug out from under the revolutionaries in Galicia and take away their greatest card. Uh, it was also explicitly referencing 1846. Uh, there was this notion of the loyalty of the serfs at that time who maintained their, uh, their loyalty to the Austrian crown and so on. Uh, and Stadion supported the abolition of Jewish special taxes, to which for the first time liberal landowners and city councils didn't object. We've seen before where Vienna or others are pushing for these sort of reforms and always they're undermined by local powers. And here for the first time, liberal landowners and city councils don't object. A week later, the emperor issues a new constitution which abolishes religious discrimination and civil and political rights. Not all Jewish disabilities, not all Jewish taxes, but many of them and guarantees the freedom of association and assembly, one of the most important liberal demands. In October of 48, the new parliament, the Reichstag, abolishes all special Jewish taxes. Now this all dissolves with the collapse of the revolution that winter, but the following March of 1849, the emperor's famous March constitution reconfirms most of these rights as part of a reassertion of Habsburg absolutism full equality before the law, civic rights for Jews and free settlement and right to purchase property. And from a Galician point of view, uh, especially Polish nobility, it had the virtue of preserving the structure of the monarchy as a collection of crown lands with the respective diets, which will continue thereafter. This emperor, by the way, this new emperor, I must mention him for a minute, we'll come back to him again, Franz Josef, who takes the throne in December of 1848, uh, he will rule uh, until 1916. He will be our emperor for most of the remainder of our Galician story. And he is an absolutely beloved emperor. There is a mythology about Franz Josef that has its own scholarship, stories about great things he did for the Jews and how he fought anti-Semites and so on. Uh, many Jews affectionately referred to him as a Fraim Yosel, 
Uh, he must be a Jew himself or certainly has a Jewish soul, that sort of thing. We'll come back to him, but here's a picture you should know. In any event, unfortunately, these uh, efforts proved to be ephemeral. As during past attempts at Jewish emancipation from above, local municipal opposition thwarts implementation. Jews obtain electoral rights in several major towns, often uh, limited, though, to 15% of councilmen, even if they constituted a majority or a near majority of the town, which, as we know, was very, very common. Moreover, an imperial edict issued in December 1851, once the revolution is securely suppressed, rose back the vast majority of reforms of the revolutionary years, with the important exception of serf emancipation, which remains. And the Jews' legal status at that point largely returns to its pre-1848 position. This happens all over Europe. Cities could decide whether to enfranchise the Jews, and they refused. Uh, further ordinance in 1853 clarified that the Jewish right to purchase land was also rescinded, although leaseholding remained free, and the ban on, on Jews hiring Christian servants, farmhands, apprentices, wet nurses, nurses, all of these had been annulled. They are now all reinstated. Guilds and university professorships, again, are closed to Jews. Jews lose access to public service as well. And 1855 ordinances prohibit their employment in the judiciary or to act as notaries. So it all rolls back. But for Jews, the most lasting effect of the revolutionary upheaval wasn't the securing of civil rights, but rather the sudden, if short-lived, political activism of Galician Jews, both secular and orthodox. Jews throughout the province participated in Polish national councils, even joined divisions of national guards. Polish patriotism was especially strong among Krakow Jews. Not a surprise, West Galicia is almost an exclusively mononational Polish area, so modernizing Jews, or even less than modernizing Jews, if they're going to be attracted to a single nationality, Polishness will be quite attractive. But the Jews didn't just fight for the Poles, they were fighting for themselves as well. Community representatives from all over Galicia assembled in Lemberg in April 1848 and demanded that the new parliament grant them full emancipation. Jews from all over Galicia actively petitioned Vienna, and especially Franz Smolka, a Polish national representative uh, who was the vice president and later the president of the assembly there, to support their full emancipation. Liberal Jews argued it was a precondition to their efforts to bring enlightened change to Galician Jewry. And indeed, many Galician towns, Krakow, Lemberg, Brody, Tizmienic, Stanisław, Zhezhov, and others, societies are established there to spread education among the Jews and, quote, to raise their moral level and material well-being. Remember this Maskelic legacy of the acceptance of Jewish degeneracy and the need for Jews to regenerate, and the connection between that and emancipation. These gradually become centers of political life. Their Jews could become familiar with political tools, appeals to government officials or bodies, pamphlets, and political literature, like the ones you read about in today's article. This is connected especially to social and educational change. The liberal elite is going to lead the way in this politicization. But you even have Yiddish political propaganda beginning to appear during this period. Famously, you read about this in your article, the Lemberger Yiddish Zeitung, published by Abraham Mendel Moore, is a very early, it's a Yiddish paper, it's really more Judeo-German, German and Hebrew characters, but still a Yiddish type paper. He also publishes an inexpensive Yiddish translation of the March Constitution, with an introduction exclaiming its great promise for the Jews. And we really have to think about these traditional Jews, because events don't just push the secular elite to action. The traditional majority also are involved. We see mass demonstrations to retake control of the Kehila in Lemberg. We see traditional Jews joining city committees, a first for Jews, national councils, national guard units. They even ran an Orthodox Jew for parliament, although he lost. Generally, they're blocking German liberals at the polls in favor of the Polish conservatives. Many are feeling growing ties with Poland and other Poles, and again, we'll come back to that next time. Now, this role of the Jews is going to be especially important in Eastern Galicia because of that triangle we spoke about, where you have Poles, Ruthenians, and Jews making up this triangle of ethnicities, and Jews over the whole of Galicia constituting the key part of that 
the key balance of that, of that uh, demography. Ruthenians and Poles each constitute about 43-44% of the, of the province, and Jews make up most of the difference. So Jewish alliance, Jewish allegiance, Jewish identity is quite important. This is also the moment of the real birth of the Ruthenian-Polish conflict, which is the definitive crisis defining Galicia for the remainder of its history. Poles had formed national committees advancing Polish national interest in 1848. Ruthenian representatives are not admitted to the national committee. Polish nobility middle class simply doesn't recognize the existence of Ruthenian nation. There's no Polish appeal to them as they had to the Jews. So Ruthenian leaders established their own national council, their own rada, their own rada, their own national council, demanding equal rights for themselves. And as we've seen, Vienna knows how to exploit conflict, and they exploit the Polish-Ruthenian conflict quite well, winning over the support of Ruthenians by recognizing them as a nationality. In fact, Poles will later falsely accuse Vienna of having invented the Ruthenians. That's not true at all. But on the other hand, indirectly, by creating Galicia, that does ultimately lead to the emergence of a Ruthenian national awareness and a Ruthenian national movement. And Vienna sees the Ruthenians as an opportunity to turn them into native Galicians and thereby loyal Austrians. Now, Ruthenians are not going to be recruiting Jews, with some exceptions we'll see down the road. And ultimately, they are in most places going to actually oppose Jewish emancipation. And there's some reasons for that. Jews are very rarely attracted to these so-called subaltern, the, uh, the anti-imperial choice. Ruthenians themselves are a suppressed minority, um, and that is rarely going to be an attractive option for Jews as they modernize in Eastern Europe. There's also a history here of Jewish-Polish closeness that we've already talked about, and the memory of something like Chemelnitsky in 1648, the uprising of Ukrainians against Polish rule in the mid-17th century, which also included the slaughter of many Jews as the partners of the Polish rulers, that still plays quite strongly two centuries, even three centuries later. Uh, that notion of Ruthenians as a bunch of Chemelnitsky Jew haters and Poles as the natural allies of the Jews, that's going to be quite influential, and we'll see more about that next time. Uh, Ruthenians tend to view Jews as exploiters of peasants, as poisoners, uh, which is, there's some truth in the sense that the Jews are the ones who have, uh, are in charge of the lease on alcohol, on taverns, and so on. Uh, there is something to that, even though it's simply a systematic problem. And we'll come back to all of that another time. Especially in Galicia, more so than elsewhere, where other gains of the revolution, above all the abolition of serfdom and land reform, were maintained, Jews keenly felt the loss of emancipation and remembered the tools that had helped them temporarily secure it. In other words, politicization stays. But critically, remember that politicized Jews are demanding natural, not national, rights. Ruthenian leaders are demanding national rights. Many Polish leaders are demanding national rights. They are beginning to view themselves as a nation demanding national rights, the way the Hungarians were certainly doing at the time. The Jews not. The Jews are demanding natural rights. And while other nationalities deepened their national consciousness during 1848, for Jews, the experience deepened only their political consciousness. Modern Jews, seeking a broader identity, chose the Austrian option, so to speak, in line with my Skelic idea, right? A political, not a national identity. And some clung to it so long that later in the empire, by the late 19th, early 20th century, when the entire empire has become so hyper-nationalized and the vast majority of people view their primary identity through national lenses, Czechs, Germans, Slovaks, uh, Hungarians, Poles, and so on. People quipped that the only Austrians left in Austria were the Jews. And there's something to that, and we begin to see it happening already here. Only in the last third of the 19th century, very much later on, after the doctrine of national self-determination had progressed sufficiently to become really almost a prerequisite for self-respect, only then would a few Jews begin to turn to Jewish nationalism in order to achieve the sort of personal dignity and overcome their sense of humiliation.
So let's take a look at what happens thereafter. Emancipation was undermined, but it was soon to arrive. Recall that Jewish emancipation was generally connected with the replacement of feudal society with the bourgeois capitalist one and the general emancipation of society. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. In Galicia, Jewish equality came even more because, even before that economic transformation was close to complete, but it was part of the broader social emancipation and political restructuring. Feudalism sticks around, but the entire empire is going to restructure and Jewish emancipation is going to be part of that. Austria is humiliated in defeats by Piedmont and France during Italian unification, exposing the weakness and increasingly uh, pressuring them to make concessions to major nationalities. Franz Josef is committed to liberal reforms, not because he's a liberal, but in order to strengthen his centralized rule, and he issues an edict on March 5th, 1860, which is going to lead to a new Reichstag appointed by delegates of the provincial diets. Later that year, he issues the so-called October Diploma, which is the beginning of a constitutional period in Austrian history. Provincial diets would appoint delegates to a permanent Reichsrat, uh, and this is modified again in 61 by the so-called February Patent. It slightly changes the, the, uh, the, the, the nature of the constitution. It's a little bit more liberal in some ways, but also more centralized in other ways, reclaiming some powers that he had delegated to the, to, the, to the provincial diets. But still, it anticipates the kind of federalized arrangement that could and would form the basis of a new Austria. A series of laws and decrees beginning in 1859 begin to remove many of the most onerous abuses of Jewish civil rights, uh, ending most restrictions on marriage in 59, for example, occupation also 59 ending residence restrictions in 1860, uh, or the, and giving the right to employ Christian servants. Some, town, some towns still banned full emancipation, sorry, some towns full, still banned uh, settlement until full emancipation in 67, and Jewish quarters were maintained in Krakow and Lemberg, but by and large, these rights of residence were being extended already in the 1860s. There were three chambers of commerce established in Galicia in 1858, one in Lemberg, one in Krakow, and one in Brody with equal access to Jewish election. In 1860, uh, restrictions on admission of Jews, of Jewish testimony in courts against Christians were lifted. Also ended the ban on Jews purchasing real estate if they had the requisite higher education. There was a debate on general Jewish political rights, but nothing happened at first. And finally, the early 1860s witnessed also a period of Polish-Jewish cooperation in general which climaxed in actual the Russian portion of Polish Jewry during the failed January uprising uh, in Congress Poland in 1863. That event is outside of our, the scope of our class, but it's a very important uh, moment in Polish Jewish cooperation. And generally speaking, it's a moment that historians see as a turning point after which Polish nationalism changed. The Polish nationalism, which had been generally open to Jews as Poles, uh, as Brian Porter once put it, it begins to hate. That Polish nationalism begins to understand Polishness as exclusive from Jewishness, and we'll come back to that another time. Complete Jewish emancipation was finally achieved only as a part of the reconstruction of the Habsburg Empire as a whole in 1867. In 1866, the, the, the Austrians had been defeated by the Prussians, and there was uh, pressure from Hungarian insurgents and the crown decides to reorganize, restructure, to give in to the Hungarians to placate them, and they remake the entire empire. This is the so-called Ausgleich and the creation of the dual monarchy, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, where Hungary is essentially sovereign other than foreign policy, which remains in the hands of the emperor. Um, in December, they issue a new constitution, not really a constitution, it's really a series of basic laws that sort of constitutes some sort of a verfassung of a constitution, and different categories abolishing all religious restrictions, universal, universal equality before the law, a limited guarantee of, of due process, uh, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, that also provides the legal basis for the continued existence of Jewish communities, the Israelitische Kultusgemeinde, uh, the establishment of a constitutional monarchy, you know, parliament, uh, and so on, and interestingly, one other thing, which doesn't exist anywhere else in the world at the time, national minority rights, that the various constituent nationalities of the empire would have a variety of national rights, 
designed to placate them the way the, to the near total sovereignty of the Hungarians was designed to placate them. This is the famous Article 19 of this new constitution. Here's how it reads. All ethnic peoples in German Volksstämme of the state have equal rights and each has the inalienable right to defend and nurture its nationality, nationality and language. The state recognizes the equal rights of all customary languages in schools, government offices, and public life. In those areas in which several peoples reside, that's going to be a lot of the empire, public education institutions are to be, found, are to be so founded that each people, without compelling the learning of a second language, receives the necessary means of education in its own language. And you have to ask, what's the defining characteristic of a nationality, of a folkstam? How do you determine that? Well, it's going to be by language. Nationality is defined by a unique language of daily use, what's known in German as an Umgangssprache, the language you would use when you go around. In other words, the language of daily use, not your mother's language, not your necessarily your mother tongue, the language you use as you go around, language of daily use. And the government set a list of nine languages from which to choose, German, Bohemian, Moravian, Slovakian. On the map in front of you, these are separated, but it was actually one category. Czechoslovakian, what we'd say today, Czech and Slovakian, Polish, Ruthenian, Slovenian, Serbo-Croatian, Italian, Romanian, and Magyar. And you have to ask yourself, what's obviously missing here? Jews. Jews are, mission, are missing. Because Yiddish, the mother tongue of, or, the, or in most cases, the only language of most Galician Jews, was deliberately not recognized, and thus Jews are not guaranteed the protection afforded to the approved languages. Uh, public education in Yiddish, government signs and publications, uh, the right to use Yiddish in courts and state offices, Yiddish contracts, not even legally binding. In fact, Yiddish and Hebrew, un unlike other unapproved languages, and there were other unapproved languages, like Slovakian, for example, have been specifically forbidden in two separate royal edicts from 1814 and 49 a legacy of Vienna's long history of Germanization of its Jewish subjects. And we ask, why did they not recognize Yiddish? Why not Yiddish? Um, and there's a variety of reasons. First of all, most people, including most Jews, did not think the Jews constituted a nationality, and most people didn't think Yiddish, which was only called jargon back then, constituted a language. Uh, Yiddish was a dialect in their mind of German. Now, it may have been quite different from German, but it was a dialect of German. It was a gutter dialect. It was uncultured. Jewish intellectuals themselves called the jargon something corrupted that, uh, it, that, in, that should be discarded in favor of a proper language. Now, if the Jews can't register as Yiddish, and again, many of them only speak Yiddish or certainly only speak it well, how would they be registered? And now we have the sudden political relevance of the Jews. Recall those numbers. 43, 44% of the province is Polish and Ruthenian, and the Jews constitute most of the rest, about 13, between 11 and 13%. Also recall that they are highly urbanized, that where they live, they tend to constitute pluralities or majorities of the towns in which they live. Suddenly it becomes quite important. Now how do you know who speaks any language? Well, the law calls for a census every 10 years. Every 10 years, the census to determine uh, who belongs to what group. And the idea of the census was to placate national strife. People could express their nationality. I am a Ruthenian speaker, and thereby there's enough of us here. We want to have a Ruthenian school and so on. But what it actually does paradoxically is makes it worse, because now every 10 years, people are forced to choose a nationality based on a language. So nationalism, which had really just been getting started around the second third of the, of the 19th century, is going to spread not less quickly, but more quickly. Remember the 46 massacre. Remember those Poles who rose up against the Polish-speaking uh, gentry. By law, they are now going to see themselves as being Poles, Poles occupied by this foreign power or part of this empire, but Poles first and foremost. Now Jews, they have to choose from among a variety of nationalities. What did they choose? And the answer depends on when we talk about. Because the Polish leadership, the Polish nobility in Galicia also wanted 
the kind of autonomy, the kind of almost sovereignty that the Hungarians got. That wasn't going to happen. But a compromise happened shy of what the Hungarians got in which the Polish elites in Galicia essentially control the province. They control the diet through a, uh, what's called the curial system of, of, elect, of who gets to vote. They control the school system, which is Polonized through a Polish-dominated school board. Polish has made the language of courts and bureaucracy. Polish language is the language of instruction in the two major universities in Krakow and Lemberg. A permanent cabinet post is created in Vienna to oversee Galician affairs, which is always in Polish hands. And at the city level, you can actually see the Polonization of the urban landscape itself. Lemberg really does become Lvov, the street names, the monuments, the festivals, and so on. And because the Poles control the bureaucracy, the Poles control the census. And you can see that in the recognition of Jewish language. Early on, at first, Jews were recognized as German. By 1880, 60.4% of Jews in Galicia were Polish. By 1900, it's 76.5%. By 1910, it's 90%. 90% of Galician Jews, about 872,000 of them, put down Polish as their language, or has it put down for them, as opposed to 20,000 only who put down Ruthenian. And it's not so much that Jews are Polonizing. It's a bit of a linguistic lie. I mean, Jews are going to Polonize in Galicia faster than in the re other parts of, in, say, central Poland under Russian rule. But it's a linguistic lie, except among the elite. The elite will Polonize. The elite, secular elite, going to secondary, at univers secondary school and university, they will switch to Polish in the 1870s and 1880s, but the mass is not. The mass is continue speaking Yiddish. And this is quite dangerous, because the Poles are using non-Polish speaking Jews as Poles to justify their domination in the polish ruthenian conflict. In sum, I want to remind you why Galician Jewry becomes so important towards the end of the century. The second largest Jewish population in the world, nearly a million people by World War I, economically, socially, religiously, similar to Tsarist Russia, similar to the other parts of the former polish lithuanian Commonwealth, in some ways, like them, are effectively constituting a proto-nation, uh, they have their own unique language for the most part, which is Yiddish, not recognized, but still. They have their own unique religion. They are mirroring almost exclusively within themselves. They occupy a unique n economic niche. They have a concentration in urban settings that makes them feel like a nation in many ways. But politically and legally, they're emancipated. We have a situation like in Western Europe. In fact, they have an advantage even over Jews in Western Europe, and, and over everyone for that matter, the theoretical ability to achieve national minority rights. Uh, they obtain political rights precisely at the moment that those rights become more important than ever. And there's a concept of Galicia. It was first used in reference to Ukrainian nationalism. Ruthenians will eventually become Ukrainian. That Galicia is a sort of Piedmont for Ukrainian nationalism. Piedmont becomes the core, of course, of the Italian nationalist movement, and Galicia serves that role for its nationalities. But not only the Ruthenians, later becoming Ukrainians, but equally so for the Poles. The Poles begin to view autonomous, undivided Galicia, because the Ruthenians want to divide Galicia between its east and west. They view autonomous, undivided Galicia as a national sanctuary for the preservation of Polish national culture. That's a mantra of the movement. Both Ukrainians and, and, and Poles, Ruthenians and Poles, because of relaxed censorship and all of these rights they've obtained, can now develop a national culture which will spread out far beyond the borders of Galicia. And the same will be true for Jews eventually. Where you have a Jewish national presence by a reasonable definition of, of nationhood, it's a construction. Nation is a construction. But by a reasonable definition, Jews are constituting this proto-nation. And you have rights associated with Western Europe, including national minority rights as part of the political culture. This is quite important. And you know, Galicia, in a sense, becomes beloved as much as it's hated. I mean, people are going to be fleeing Galicia. Jews, in fact, will see 
are going to emigrate from Galicia at higher percentages than from Russia itself because what really pushes people to leave Eastern Europe will be economic crisis more than anti-Semitism. Galicia has very little anti-Semitism compared to further east, but the economic situation is far worse. You know, there is a sense of this sort of barbarian wilderness of Galicia, but at the same time, it's going to serve as midwife to national movements of all of its inhabitants. And the key agent of that is certainly going to be freedom of association and the freedom of the press. We have here now um, a quote by the great Sacher Masoch. He was um, a police chief whose son, Leopold, becomes one of the most famous uh, writers to come out of Galicia. The word masochism comes out of his stories. And here's what he writes in, a, in, a, in an essay. Greetings to my countrymen. Far from the homeland, I send you this greeting. I do not choose as in your songs the tender nightingale, the proud swan, the lively lark as messenger, but the printing press. It is not gleaming wings, but its thousands and thousands of paper pinions travel throughout the world, just as you are scattered, my countrymen. My messenger will find you and greet you on the boulevards and the pallid splendor of the half moon and the cabin of the prairie, as well as in the homeland. I greet you all, for it was one land, Galicia, that gave us all birth, Poles, Ruthenians, Germans, and Jews. A conception of Galicianness that includes all of these groups, celebrating the printing press as its greatest symbol. And if the printing press is, in fact, a great part of what makes Galicia so wonderful. But what that's going to do ultimately is not to bring these groups together, but rather that to divide them. The press, especially in light of the linguistic definition of nationhood in Austria. If the Jews successfully win the recognition of Yiddish as an official language, they could win the same rights that Ruthenians and Poles and others are already enjoying, but Galician Jews first had to come to a decision that Yiddish, in fact, did constitute a language, that Jews, in fact, did constitute a nation. And in the 1870s and 1880s, very few Jews, much less others, had come to that conclusion. Uh, this process of coming to that conclusion, we'll say for, for another time, the dominant modes of modern Jewish politics that will eventually dominate Galicia were, first of all, liberal, and in reaction to that, Orthodox. We're going to see the birth of modern Jewish politics now in the 60s and 70s and early 80s before we see it further east because of the context of emancipation and the important politicization going on. But it won't be the nationalists and the socialists first. We'll first start with the liberals and the Orthodox and we'll pick up the story of modern Jewish politics next time. Thanks a lot.